evening, friends. I am Reverend Dr. Waltrina Middleton, Executive Director with Community Renewal Society. We are so happy to welcome you here for this important community conversation as we head into the final leg of a Chicago mayoral race runoff. We hope this forum will serve as an educational platform and a safe space for you and your community to gather and prayerfully discern the ethical, moral, and socio-political values meaningful for you to see in your mayor and civic leaders. This is not a platform of endorsement for either of the two candidates. We do wish to acknowledge both campaigns, Mr. Brandon Johnson and Mr. Paul Vallis, for considering our invitation to join CRS Community Conversation. Invitations were sent to both campaigns and we have been flexible to adjust to the changing tides and fast pace of the campaign trail. That includes adjusting our schedule so that our conversation would not conflict with a live debate that was confirmed only after CRS forum was planned. We recognize both candidates are doing all they can to share their platforms with the residents of Chicago. We are grateful to follow the live debate with this opportunity to interact with each of you and all who believe in love, justice, and freedom across our beloved city. We offer to accommodate the candidates by pre-recording their interviews with our esteemed moderator, author, editor, and publisher, Katara Washington Patton. Some of the questions you submitted in advance were asked of the candidates, and we will share your responses. We are so grateful for Katara Washington Patton serving as our moderator this evening. She serves as senior editor with Our Daily Bread Publishing and has worked in the editorial and acquisition departments at the Chicago Defender, Christian Century, Tyndale House Publishers, Urban Ministries, McGraw-Hill and Jet Magazine. Our award-winning moderator's most recent book, Navigating the Blues, Where to Turn When Worry and Anxiety Steals Your Hope, debuted on Amazon's bestsellers list for new releases. Her accomplishments of publication is extensive, as well as her achievements as a scholar and humanitarian committed to faith, culture, mental health well wellness, and social justice. You can find her full bio on CRS website, communityrenewalsociety.org, and also our social media platforms as we live stream. Please connect with our moderator on Instagram, Katara WP, or on Facebook, Katara Patton. Joining our moderator is a diverse panel of thinkers, leaders, servants, and instrumental voices vested in this election from their locations as educators, policymakers, clergy, and citizens of Chicago. They will be formally introduced and will help us delve deeply into this conversation alongside your questions. For those joining us live on social media platforms, we want to make sure this is a safe forum for all Violence in all, in any form, will not be tolerated, and we will actively remove anyone who violates our policies for safe, respectful, and inclusive discourse. Today's community conversation will be archived on our platforms for future viewing. On behalf of our congregational sponsors, Urban Village Church and Trinity United Church of Christ, CRS Board of Directors, and our entire dedicated CRS staff, we hope to leave our time together more informed and more inspired to vote and to be active participants in our democracy by voting and holding our officials accountable. There is so much at stake and with a mission to eradicate racism and poverty, Community Renewal Society remains fervently committed to being a resource of education, activism, and transformation for love and justice. Welcome. Again, welcome to the Community Renewal Society's Mayoral 
candidate and uh, community discussion. As um, while Trina mentioned, we did get to speak with one of the candidates this week, actually earlier today, Commissioner Brandon Johnson. And um, we're gonna ask the panelists to respond to some of the things he said, as well as share their thoughts on what they've heard throughout this election. And I'd like to reiterate, the CRS does not endorse candidates, nor does our panelists endorse any candidate. We want them to share how we should be thinking around the issues. For those of you who are still undecided, you may be able to make your decision based on our, our conversation today. So let me introduce to you our panelists. We are so thankful to have the following people joining us and sharing their expertise around their community work. We have Reverend Darren Calhoun. He's a justice advocate, worship leader, and artist. He's based out of Chicago, and he works to bridge connections between people of differing perspectives through story and relationship. Darren brings with him an intentional focus on communities being inclusive as an authentic reflection of God's love and justice. Our next panelist is Dr. Elias Ortega. He is committed to building organizational systems in which people, especially those underrepresented in our society, can thrive. He uses the lenses of religious ethics spirituality, and the theological reflection to foster change in higher education, nonprofit organizations, and religious institutions. Dr. Ortega currently serves as the president of Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago. Our next guest is Calmetta Coleman. Calmetta is chief operating officer of the Chicago Urban League. She is responsible for ensuring efficient operations across the organization, overseeing programs, providing strategic leadership for external affairs, and helping to execute the vision of the president and CEO. Calmetta lives in the Galewood neighborhood of Chicago on the west side with her husband, and they have two children in college. Our next guest is Reverend Carlos Rodriguez. He is a quad chair for the Illinois Poor People's Campaign. He currently works for a not-for-profit called West Care Illinois as a program director where he oversees drug, alcohol, and violence prevention work in nine alternative high schools in Chicago's West and South Sides. Carlos and his mother founded the Albuquerque Border Cities Project, ABC, in 1986 and it's dedicated to monitoring the abuses of the Immigration and Naturalization Service in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Our next panelist is Alderwoman Rosanna Rodriguez. She is a mother and resident of the Albany Park neighborhood. Prior to taking office, Alderwoman Rodriguez worked as a youth educator and was involved in community groups and an activist and organizer. You may find more information about our esteemed group of panelists on our website at communityrenewalsociety.org. As I mentioned earlier, we, got, we had the privilege of speaking with Commissioner Johnson earlier today. So what we're gonna do tonight is play clips from different um, pieces that he spoke to. We asked about different things around different subjects that we felt were important to our voters. We're gonna play those videos each separately and we'll have the community um, panelists then discuss some of these issues. So let's get started with our first issue. Of course, the hottest ticket, the hottest button here is crime and public safety. So today we asked Commissioner Brandon Johnson to share with us what he would do in his first few days on the job if he's elected as mayor. Right, let's talk about crime. I read on your website that you said you are going to enact policy shifts day one of your administration. Tell us what that looks like. Yeah, thank you for that question. Obviously, public safety is something that everyone is deeply concerned about. Um, it's been problematic in the city for a long time. It's becoming increasingly problematic. 
um, over the course of the last four years, particularly within carjackings and robberies and thefts and, of course, the murders. And we're not solving crime. And I live in one of those beautiful, dynamic communities on the west side of Chicago, Austin. And it is one of the more um, disinvested communities. And so as a result of that, um, you know, crime, unfortunately, um, is um, quite pervasive. And so what I've proposed is one day one train and promote 200 more detectives. Um, we can do that um, in order to make sure that we are actually bringing closure um, to, to violent crimes. We have to do that. Second of all, um, day one, we, we can enforce um, the red flag laws that are not being enforced. These are laws um, in which people have access to guns that shouldn't have them. And so we actually get to invest and spend to make sure that we are um, implementing and pushing the laws that are already in the books. Three, um, day one, we get to start spending towards the implementation of the consent decree. I'm happy to have the support of the top legal officer for the state of Illinois, the attorney general. And there are dynamics within the consent decree that we can start to move day one. One, funding the institutions that have been charged to come up with the type of reform measures that can shift policy. Two, making sure that we have the funds to provide mental health support for law enforcement. The other big thing that we can do day one, and this will happen in the midst of our transition, is really about prevention. That's really what our goal is around public safety. And the data has proven over and over again, there's a direct correlation between youth employment and violence reduction. That's why I'm committed to doubling the amount of young people that we hire, not just for summer jobs, but year round jobs. And then finally, mental health services. We can pass treatment, not trauma. Um, that's gonna provide mental health responders, EMTs, to show up to the 911 calls that are almost 40% of them um, are mental health crises. By doing this, this frees up law enforcement to be more strategic and smart of how we deploy them. So these are just some of the four or five things that we can do day one, the moment that I'm sworn in on May 15th. To, you've heard what Commissioner Johnson just said, and we must add that we did invite uh, Mr. Paul Vallis to speak with us also. His schedule would not allow, but we've heard his, his platform as well. We've been through this for many weeks. So um, I wanna ask the panelists to begin, each of you, I want you to share, what are some of the things we should be thinking about around um, public safety and crime as it relates to what we've heard the candidates say? they want to do? What can we use to inform our votes? We can begin with you, Reverend Darren Calhoun. Hi there. It's so good to, to be with everyone uh, today. I really, my ears really perk up anytime we talk about public safety, because as a Black man, as uh, a queer man who lives in Chicago, there is such an important need for me to navigate these waters where um, in two different ways, uh, my kind of threatened by many of the powers that be. And so I'm not keen on us uh, having conversations of increasing Chicago's police force with it already being 40% of the city's budget. I don't have faith that that will be the answer or that that will uh, resolve anything for us. But I do um, like the idea of putting a lot more work into addressing mental health crises, um, ad addressing ways that that people can be cared for rather than policed and punished. Um, so yeah, we've got a, we've got a lot to see. We've got a lot of accountability to hold. Um, in our last or in our previous election, we had people kind of hoping, oh, because this person is a black person, um, that we're going to have an automatic in. But I really think we'll have to see who's ready to be accountable and who's ready to, to interface with our uh, with our community organizations to make sure that kind of accountability happens. Wonderful. Thank you, Reverend Calhoun. We'll go to Dr. Elias Ortega next. Thank you for the opportunity to, to participate in, in this dialogue. I think I would like to start uh, by, by mentioning uh, something that is, is from my own experience. Um, Any time in during my life, whether as a, as a young Latino growing up um, or now as a young adult, any time I hear words like uh, safety, right, making our spaces uh, safer for the people, I, I wonder two things. Uh, one, who are the people for whom we are making our communities safer? 
in how the language of increasing safety and, and security will impact uh, people who, who look like me, uh, my children, uh, black and brown uh, youth and, and teens, um, because more often than not, that particular discourse uh, usually end up in increased policing of community of color. And that, that increased policing is oftentimes used as, as a way to not only control right, our communities, um, but it's also a way of controlling um, economic and political power as well. I think we, we all know of, of the impact of, of mass incarceration in how practices of, of policing black and brown communities extract wealth right, from uh, communities of color and move them into uh, other pockets of, of the city uh, or the state. And that is a concern right, that, that I have. Um, I'm also particularly concerned in the way in, this, in which in this major race, right, issues of security and policing really come to, to the fore um, as one of the primary issues in a way in which uh, can promote uh, not only fear, but also can distract for some of the, some of the causes, right, that, that leads to or to kind of other kinds of economic activity uh, in order for the economics of a city to work. So I think by, by emphasizing economic development, right, by emphasizing um, education uh, are particular ways in which we can then uh, address issues of, of, of crime without necessarily increasing policing. I think interventions of social services, uh, mental health, and working closely with faith communities uh, can actually help reduce, uh, right, uh, recidivism can reduce particular crime rates without necessarily involving um, policing. I'm also uh, concerned, right, in, in the ways in which the, the conversation of increased security is not necessarily accompanied, right, by particular training, right, and development uh, in terms of cultural competence, and, uh, competency in terms of the escalation, right, that may be necessary and actually required, um, right, for, for the police force to be effective, right, in this city. Um, I, am, I am concerned as well by the timing, right, of training through which the, the academy uh, works. And I think we have heard in different concepts from the candidates, uh, the different timelines for training of police between 18 months to two years, right, in Johnson and Vajas thinking about six months. And, and I think given, given the power, right of, of the police and the possibility right of uh, many of our members of color right and, and disability um, uh, impacted folks and uh, trans youth of color and queer youth right we need to be very attentive right of what is the discourse right of increased policing uh, that needs to be accompanied right by, by training but emphasizing right all the ways of, of managing right community relationships and I think if, finally and I know this is center in the city but uh, a concern Concern that, that I bring uh, clearly is when we talk about guns, right, and restricting guns access in the city, and we do not have conversation with with the suburbs, right, and even across state lines that we know are the places in which uh, illegal guns, right, are moving into the city. I think it requires a, a statewide conversation that is not only uh, Chicago centric. Wow. Thank you for that thoughtful response there, um, Kameda. Well, how how should we be thinking around crime and public safety? Yeah, so I would echo a lot of the things. First of all, thank you, uh, Katera. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. I would echo a lot of the things that uh, the two individuals who went before me said. Um, I will say that, you know, when we talk about crime and public safety, we should always be thinking about causes, right? So policing is only one answer. There are a lot of reasons that crime happens, uh, inequity being one of them. And so we should be thinking about how do we invest in our communities? How do we invest in our young people? Um, how do we, you know, make sure that there is not such disparity, you know, when you look at, you know, wealth across our city, um, and you know, a lot of the crimes, the 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 um, the person who was speaking right before me talked about, you know, keeping our our community safe, making it safe for who, right? So a lot of the crime that we see has been in many of the communities that are poor communities across our city for, um, you know. Ever And increasingly what we're seeing as the, the voice has gotten louder about the cry against crime as you're seeing them spread across the city, spread into downtown. Um, and so those are things that we have to make sure that people understand that, yes, let's protect our business in our downtown, but let's also protect all of our communities as well. So we'll be thinking about how do we bring opportunity that will maybe deter someone from um, 
uh, looking at crime as an answer? How do we have mental health resources? So thinking about how do we invest in our communities outside of just policing? Very good. Thank you very much for bringing up those um, important pieces there. Um, Reverend Carlos Rodriguez. Okay. And if uh, I made you a Reverend, go ahead yeah, and accept yeah. it. <laughs> I just sent a screenshot to my wife. She got a kick out of that. But um, again, honored to be here. Thank you for these panelists. You know, I'm going to echo a little bit about what people have already said, but Calmetta, thank you for, for saying we got to look at the causes, right? I mean, tough decisions require accurate assessments, right? And when I think about crime and violence, I'm always thinking about right away about poverty, right? You know, we have 140 million people that are in poverty across the United States and over 4 million in Illinois. And we know that police don't solve crimes. So why do we keep talking about that, right? Um, I work in a field where I work with a lot of nonviolent offenders and I work with a lot of kids on the West and South sides of Chicago and alternative schools. And a lot of them need treatment. A lot of them need jobs. And, I, and, 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 they're, and they're afraid, they're afraid to go outside. Um, I, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave you with this piece here. I, I I love this quote, and a lot of people don't get it, and I think it really resonates with me. Uh, now that I've been in Chicago since 1989, everybody thinks the African proverb goes, "It takes a village to raise a child." That's only half of it. I don't know if you guys know that. The rest of the proverb says, "The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth." Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want wow. you to think about that. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. I, I, I think when I hear the candidate speak, you know, I, I know the direction I'm going. That candidate that's willing to say, we've got to embrace our youth, make them feel a part of the community. The, 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 the solutions can be found right there in the community. Uh, we've got to roll that way. So again, thank you for having me. Wow. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to be saying that quote and remembering it, right? Alderwoman Rosanna Rodriguez, we'll give you some time to speak about policing sure. and crime. Public so I, I have been um, in the city council now for uh, four years, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about these things. Um, I wrote Treatment Not Trauma, which is the ordinance that uh, Brandon Johnson has been talking about. Um, this is not rocket science. We can completely do this. And the reality is that uh, we have defunded all of our structures of care, and we have replaced it with policing. So our job right now in order to have safer communities and a safer society is to refund all of the services that we have defunded. Um, and I, I wanna throw out a few numbers. Um, so the Chicago Police Department, their budget is $1.9 billion a year, but that doesn't tell the whole story because um, operationally, the Chicago Police Department uses about $3 billion because there's a lot of money um, in expenses that are not labeled on the, the Chicago Police Department. There is things that are done by assets, for example, in terms of vehicle maintenance, um, utilities. Um, but when you look, for example, at the Department of Public Health, only 7% of the uh, whole budget of the Chicago Department of Public Health comes from the corporate budget. So most of the work from the Department of Public Health is done with grants uh, from the federal level, the state level, philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, and if at any point we lose that funding for whatever reason, we are not able to operate and we're not able to take care of people. So we have been prioritizing the criminalization of trauma, the criminalization of um, all of the things that, that are related to social services, to lack of supports, right? Um, and, and, and we have been using the police as the only option and that has hurt our communities deeply. Um, so I, I agree with the approach that Brandon is trying to take. Treatment of trauma will be a comprehensive approach that will definitely help us um, use the right tools to meet the needs of communities. Uh, it's only one part of it, but I, I do have a lot of faith that um, um, materializing treatment, not trauma, is going to have a deep impact in, in the safety of our city. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you all for speaking on crime and public safety and your answers really brought up some stuff already. Um, we're gonna move to education. We heard 
the, the profound quote about a child who is not embraced in the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Let's talk a little bit about that. We talked to um, Commissioner Brandon Johnson about the disparity. And I brought up a particular case that's happening in the South Loop where we want to build a high school um, in and really there's a high school there in, in some ways are, um, it's not creative solutions we're hearing in the community. So let's take a listen to what um, Commissioner Johnson said about that. And the next we'll item, the big item here that you have a lot of experience in is education. And we talk a lot about the tale of two cities. For one, um, let's take for instance, the South Loop High School that's been a big issue in the news some people want to build a high school. Other people say, put money in the window, Phillips. What do, you, what do you think about that? And how does that relate to your education, your thoughts? Yes, around? look, so yes, public education, that, that the business of Chicago is the education of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm, I've been pushing for the Chicago Public Schools to actually embrace the new funding formula that I was a part of the organizing to actually change that. And so the new funding formula has made it very clear. We need to base our funding on need, not per pupil. And because we're not basing it on need, Chicago Public Schools is leaving $1 billion on the table. So one, we're gonna make sure that, that we embrace the funding formula that I helped organize and change. Two, I believe in sustainable community schools. That's gonna be important. We're talking about a community school model that allows for real investment to take, that, to take place and make sure that we're providing funding that supports the unique challenges that exist in a variety of communities. There's got to be a baseline for every single school, and that's what I've been fighting for as a teacher, as an organizer, and a Cook County Commissioner. As far as this specific dynamic around the South Loop um, High School, look, I'm, I'm about collaborating and putting together a process where the community gets to participate. Nothing should be done without the support and the guidance of the people who will be impacted. And that's been my approach as a teacher, as an organizer. It's been my approach as a Cook County Commissioner, as we have managed multi-billion dollars of taxpayer dollars. And so I'm certainly confident that we can build a type of coalition that puts the interest and the needs of parents and students and those who do the work at front and center before we make any decision. Okay. Um... We apologize for the technical difficulty. Just to let you know, all of these videos, as well as this forum, will be able to be viewed on our website, the um, Chicago Renewal Society.org. So if you want to go back and hear the bits there that you missed, you, you please do. But um, let's talk to our panelists about education. What should the community be thinking about as it relates to who we vote for and, and their stance on education? A couple of issues I want to just raise and you can touch upon them if you feel inclined. We know Johnson is backed by the Chicago Teachers Union. Could that be a pro or a con that you have a great relationship with the Teachers Union? Um, and we also know Vallis, whatever we may interpret of his record, he was the CEO of Chicago Public School Systems here as well as in Philadelphia. He was superintendent of schools in Bridgeport, Connecticut and New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, how do we interpret his record and, and what does that say about what he might do as mayor, particularly around the um, area of education? I want to start with the older woman because she says that she is an advocate for public education. So I'd love to hear from her. We'll get to the rest of you too. Um, so one thing that was really impressive to me um, about the Chicago Teachers Union and as, uh, as, uh, about Brandon as, uh, as a leader um, is that they actually made popular the idea that you could bargain for the common good. And um, I think that we need to make sure that we understand the, the moment that we are in um, there are a lot of big economic interests uh, that are vying for public services to make them profitable for specific people, companies. Um, and, and the difference, I believe, between Paul Vallas, who has already demonstrated that he is in favor of school privatization, of charter schools, of vouchers, of choice. Um, and then in, on the other hand, you have a teacher that has been bargaining for the common good, that has been trying to invest in our public infrastructure. Um, I think I think those are two opposite ends of the spectrum and something that we need to absolutely take into account because I think at this point 
we need to be building public structures. We need to make sure that we're funding public structures and that we make those public structures sustainable. Um, and the privatization of our public services, including education, is the opposite of that. Um, so I, I, I think that, that it's the main difference between them. And in their history, Paul Valles has a legacy of trying to privatize schools. Uh, Brendan Johnson has been fighting for public schools and public infrastructure. Okay. Thank you for that. Kamata, we'll go to you. You are familiar with the Chicago public school systems. You had two kids come through there. Can you share with us what we should be thinking around um, education? Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, I have a son and a daughter, both who graduated from Chicago public schools. And I will say that Chicago public schools, uh, the system works for some people right? For some people who are able to um, navigate their way through the selective enrollment and all of those things, um, it, it, the system can work. But it's also, we look and we see that a lot of people leave the city because of the school system, because they're not getting the same level of education as the students who are in, you know, those top level schools, uh, public schools in the city. And so we should really be looking and pressing each of the candidates to uh, think about the investment in education for all the students in the city. So that, you know, the, the kids on the south and west sides of Chicago and poor communities also have that same access to education. And so, you know, you, you started out raising the question about the school in the South Loop. You know, I, I can't ever argue against investing in public schools. I think that that is great, but we want to see that same kind of investment in the schools in our communities and that, you know, that children should be able to go to schools in their community and get a good, high quality education. It's really the foundation. Thank you so very much, Kalmetta. We're going to ask the other guests if they would like to respond specifically on education to do so the next time they talk. We have a lot of things happening. We have some questions that have come to us through the chat and we wanna make sure our community gets to ask the questions they'd like to ask. So we're gonna turn it over to Karan who is gonna share some of those questions for our panelists directly from our audience. Hey everyone, it's so good to be here. It's so good to be part of this really, really important conversation. And I, I wanna echo Dr. Middleton's thanks to the team for working so really hard on, on getting this, this conversation going. Uh, one of the questions I, that came up in the, the comments, and it is from, I think, Dr. Lightsey, and, and it's a, a comment and a question, and I want to throw it to the, the panel to both reflect and perhaps incorporate this in, in their later responses. But it says, candidate Dallas has campaigned with a slogan, take the handcuffs off the police. As an older white man, it is tone deaf to how, is he tone deaf to how that sounds to many black and brown people? That kind of rhetoric doesn't bode well for marginalized people. So the question is around, again, police and crime and this idea of taking the cops off the police and whether or not the, the panelists feel as though this is, this is tone deaf to how this resonates in communities of color. The other question that has come uh, to us through the registration that I want to throw to the, the, the panelists is around development, right? So uh, this person says lots of development happening, including the South Shore Nature Sanctuary, which is the proposed Tiger Wood golf course. Um, the, the golf course is seeking to eliminate the nature preserve. And there's this question around how should candidates be thinking about development? And how should voters be evaluating the development proposals of these candidates, thinking specifically about issues of race and economic justice? I know that's a lot. I see Darren's head. <laughs> right? But this question, again, we're talking you know, about race in a way, right? And we talk about handcuffs off the police. Does, does that sound tone deaf to you? And then this notion of development and how we approach development in the city of Chicago. Sure, I'll, I'll hop in. <laughs> Thank you so much, Darren. <laughs> um, yes, I, you know, uh, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Lightsey, for bringing up that particular quote. Um, we 
in this country, we've seen a wave of people who very traditionally have sided with um, with these dog whistle type of, of phrases, taking the cuffs off the police. Um, just yesterday, I was sent a text message that tried to use, um, use right uh, around what happens if we take the cuffs off the police or what happens if we um, if we work with people who have who've cried out uh, defund the police and I think we really uh, especially as people of faith as, as people who are community based we need to realize as that fear as a tactic has been running rampant um, really since the election of, of Trump, um, but in so many ways that down to our local elections. And we can't let these kind of, um, I don't know what it looks like, so therefore it's a, something I should be afraid of. We can't let that inform our politics. So what I would really like to see is very comprehensive conversations about the ways that um, the ways that we not only hold our elected officials accountable, but about the ways that we look at at the way look at how they're advertising, look at how they're talking to us. Are they trying to get us to, to make choices based on fear, or are they informing us of very real and active policies mm -hmm. that are participatory that invite us all to have a healthier and a safer way to look at our communities uh, when it comes to redevelopment. If the redevelopment is just simply going to push people from a certain economic status out of the city or into other neighborhoods, then we're just repeating the cycle that happened in places like Lawndale um, and the, the effects of redlining. If we don't have, um, if we don't have education that looks at a whole student and their lives and, and is trauma-informed, these kind of things, then we're really going to create the same systems, just like No Child Left Behind, just like all these previous sounds good on paper, but in fact have um, hugely detrimental impacts on students and families. Um, we, we see what these fear campaigns can do, and I, I'm really hoping that we uh, take a critical eye to these things, but I, I'd love to hear from, from my other panelists on this too. I love this, that you're encouraging us that I almost preach, preach at this notion of we have a choice between fear or being informed, right? And uh, it's a part of why we are here to combat the use of fear to get votes. I want to go to Dr. Uh, Elias, I think, uh, for their two cents on, on this. And then I want to bring in uh, Kalmeta to talk about development. And I'll throw it back to our moderator after that. Yes. Oh. Absolutely. I think, thank you. What, what I would like to share is uh, really, really combining the question of education with the question of policing. And, and I think it's really, really important. And I think centering our times uh, in which we have seen so much um, kind of criticism, right, and, and really uh, sidestepping and trying to prevent uh, critical education around um, Black history, right, particularly Black history um, and, and critical, uh, critical race studies to, to remember, right, the, in the history of Chicago, right, to remember the long reach of Jim Crow right here in Illinois. I think it's, it's easy to, to forget, right, in our times that Illinois, many parts of Illinois were sundown towns, right, and that Jim Crow kind of segregation also shaped uh, the city, right, of Chicago. And, and I think we, we can, that impact is really clearly seen in the way in which public education was segregated, right, between the 50s, right, 40s, 50s, and 60s in, into the 70s. Uh, in fact, there were two, uh, uh, urban rebellions, right, in the city 66 and 68, pertaining to the state of public schools and the ways in which uh, they were being segregated, right, and putting black students, right, in overcrowded schools with less resources and moving, right, um, as the, the, the white flight is happening to other parts of the city and into the suburbs, moving resources that way. And the way that the state, right, and the city was able to get around it, right, saying we're just following the students, right, we're not intentionally segregating, right, our community because the, the neighborhoods themselves are already segregated by ethnic right and other populations and I think it is important for us to remember the way in which uh, that history still shapes right the way in which public education ha has worked in Chicago and continue to work but also to understand the layers of policing that goes along 
in public education, right? I think the the ways in which uh, resource officers, right, can can be used as a way to controlling, right, the bodies of youth of color in elementary and middle schools that are already interacting, right, with law enforcement daily, right. We can expect that that will have a particular impact, right, of trauma as they go into the school. And I know as 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 a parent, right, of of young kids of color, right, that is something that I have had to deal with it at home. Right. What does it mean that the first interaction that my son may have right in a day of school would be with a police officer, right, as he goes into school? And what does that mean for somebody, right, mm -hmm. to then go through a whole day, right, of, of education, right, after having that experience? And I think that that is important, right, because um, it, it is not uh, for me tone deaf, it's that they are showing us, right, who they are and what mm -hmm. the intent is, right? We're being informed, right, that the intent is to, to unleash surveillance, unleash policing, right? into our communities and doing so openly. So I think if they tell us, right, how they're doing things, we should be mindful, right, of that, pay yeah. attention, and also remember, right, the history, right, of the city so that we don't repeat it again. Got it. So I'm, I'm going to say not a history lesson, sir, not a history lesson. Um, love that, that the, the use of dog whistle politics, the, the use of tone deaf language, the use of um, you know, is not unintentional sometimes. So you've been really instructive. I want to bring in uh, Kalmeta to talk about development and then I'll throw it back to our moderator. Thank you so much, Karan. So yeah, I wanted to speak on this because when you talk about development, so often we talk about the disinvestment that's happened in many of our communities. Um, and you see, you know, vast areas of, of land that are vacant. And so as development starts to happen, we really should be pushing both candidates and never mind the candidates, but whoever is elected, because it will be one of them to make sure that our approaches to development are equitable. That means that development isn't just happening around our communities. And when I say our, I mean black and brown communities, the poor communities, um, but that we can be active participants in that development. And so that instead of having, you know, the minimum participation of minority uh, contractors, that we are actually removing barriers that limit their participation in those development projects, that we are really being thoughtful about how we allow different um, people who ordinarily are really underrepresented in the development process, whether that is as subcontractors, certainly as you rarely see um, Black people as uh, or Black companies as uh, the main general contractors, but how can we really take approaches that keep wealth in the communities, bring wealth into the communities, and actually have the residents of the communities that where development is happening to benefit from that? Thank you all so much. What brilliant responses. Um, while we're here, as I have the microphone, as I say, I want to invite those who are watching to join us tomorrow. Uh, all of what we're doing is part of a campaign that we call My Congregation Votes, where we are hoping to use these settings to inform the politic and the political decisions of our, of our folk. And so tomorrow we're having another program called Reflect, Pray, Vote. It's at 12 p.m. sort of in the middle of the day, sort of a, a respite from all of the whatever you're doing tomorrow, 12 o'clock, about 30 minutes conversation prayer as we go into the final leg of this runoff election. So join us tomorrow. Thank you all so much. Well, um, we're covering our community and our city in prayer during such a critical time as we get ready to have our new mayor. It's, it's coming. So um, Carlos Rodriguez did want to add something about a connection of development and education. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I want to get my my ears are burning when I heard when I heard this quote about taking off the handcuffs. You know, I would encourage people that that, that may be fooled by that to look at our own professor, John Hagedorn here at UIC. He wrote a book that that clearly is researched throughout the years that when you increase police presence in terms of uh, interdiction, then actually the crime goes up. Isn't that interesting? Okay, John Hagerdorn, H-A-G-E-D-O-R, and he's done great work around understanding the connection between, uh, you know, um, punitive actions against young people and the increase of crime. And of course, everybody knows Ta-Nehisi Coates between the world and me. I mean, come on, if you don't know if you didn't pay attention to what happened around the Quan McDonald, you don't have a heart. Okay, so th there's my emotional input, so I can calm my ears down. The other piece is is, is this: is that 
none of these conversations around development can be had without talking about our kids, right? At any time, almost one in five children in Chicago are homeless, okay? How can you, how can you say that, that's, that, that we should pay attention to development unless you're not developing you know, solid quality educations for our kids, right? Uh, across the nation, of course, the, the, the figures from Harvard are 52.1% of kids under 18 live in poverty, right? So, so for me, I keep thinking that I love the, my alternative school families and my teachers and the communities that, 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 I, that I serve. And, and people are just trying to survive right now. And, and so we've got to look at that and figure out ways to, to establish, you know, really solid foundations you know, for people to thrive, right? I think no question of development can be can be entertained, you know, without thinking about that. I'm gonna add one more thing to it because I, I love these figures. For every $1 invested in early childhood education, again, this is, this is from Harvard, society would gain $7.30 due to reduced poverty, lower incarceration rates and better health outcomes, okay? Um, and th these are just, just simple things that you can Google but but it's it's more like how do we, we we've got to organize to to make that happen right i think the the, the people know this stuff instinctively uh but but we, but we have to encourage them to get out there organize mobilize and vote thank you so much and we want to apologize for again for technical difficulties we recognize the the beauty of technology as well as sometimes the issues that we might have with that we think there was a little tap in noise going on with uh, mr rodriguez's microphone so we'll make sure we fix that so we can hear his great points clearly here um let's move on to a, another subject that everyone's talking about and it has to do with how we're going to pay for the programs that we're talking about to help in these areas. It boils down to taxes and the budget. I got to ask Commissioner Johnson to share a little bit more specifically about his plans around this. Let's talk about funding some of those ideas and your tax plans. Um, we also read that um, you do plan to tax the suburbs, airlines, and ultra-rich. What exactly does that mean? And who are the ultra-rich? Yeah, well, well look, um, we should make sure that we are clear about how we got here. So we have a structural deficit that was caused and created by obviously the very individual who I'm running against, a $2.5 billion tax bill, property tax bill that we are on the hook to pay. And because of that bad financing in the 90s, we are now living through the nightmare of that type of structural damage. And so what my budget plan does is it eliminates the structural deficit it makes up to one billion dollars of new investments over the course of four years and we do it without raising property taxes so there is no tax on the suburbs what we are calling for the large corporations 70 percent of large corporations in 2022 alone did not pay a corporate tax i mean that's who we're talking about this is not that much different than when president biden said in the state of the union address about a month ago that a teacher and a firefighter should not pay the same tax rate as a millionaire and a billionaire. I mean, these are, these are individuals, of course, that want businesses to be in the city of Chicago, but they also know that the reason why we're not attracting businesses is because we don't have a safe Chicago. So we have to do what safe American cities do and what safe American cities do, they, they invest in people. You know, so we're talking very, you know, moderate, um, modest um, increases for the revenue that can ultimately save lives. So one of the instances, we're talking about a corporate head tax, we're talking about $1 per per person. And this is for companies that do over $20 million worth of business in the city of Chicago and have over 50, 50 employees, right? We're also talking about a hotel tax, but that's $1 per room. That's what we're proposing. I mean, is one dollar per room worth saving a life? I would, I would, I would, I would believe so, right? And so, I'm the only person who's running for mayor who's actually put forth a budget plan, um, so people can debate it because I think it's important that we're transparent about the work that we want to do. Okay, we left off on one dollar, <laughs> one dollar per room, um, saying that that's kind of the gist of his proposal um, for taxes and increases to figure out how to handle this budget. I want to go to um, Carlos on that, particularly because he has done work with the Poor People's Campaign and figure out how does that type of um, plan impact people in your lower income communities, um, lower and middle income communities. 
and you're more than welcome to roll into that any discussion around um, Paul Vallis's plans as well. Yeah, well, clearly uh, Cop Commissioner Johnson's plans uh, resonate with me, right? Um, we've talked about that over and over again in the Poor People's Campaign about, you know, corporate greed and, um, you know, it's, it's high time we organize to, to challenge that, right? Um, you know, right now, uh, just a tiny tax on Wall Street could fund $70 billion needed to provide public college for all, right? So I'm looking at th this whole idea. When he, when he talks about his budget, what I love about him is he keeps emphasizing this idea is that it really does start with youth, right? And taking care of the community. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that will try to scare us saying, oh, we'll, we'll scare industries from running out of Illinois. That hasn't happened since I've been here. I think that's a, that's a myth. And we need to challenge that myth, right? There's a distorted narrative out there um, that 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 we can we 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 need to organize to challenge that. Yeah, I'll I'll end by just saying this on this point, right? Is that um, there is definitely a fundamental difference between these two, right? Uh, uh, Alder person or uh, Rodriguez said it best. Vallis has a proven record of gutting the system here, and the the other we know the other candidate is saying let's make these tough decisions right and and thoughtful and make conscientious assessments collectively with, with all of the city of chicago there's not certain sections that are more important than the others what plans do you have around addressing the needs of the homeless community in chicago as well as affordable housing in the yeah. city yeah thank you for that as a public school teacher i can tell you i've looked into the eyes of young children um, who show up to school every single day, either hungry or tired. And that has a lot to do with the fact that we have 65,000 plus families that are unhoused, of which almost 20,000 of them are, are students. And that's why I'm a big pro proponent and a supporter of the Bring Chicago Home Ordinance. I mean, we're talking about raising millions of dollars annually to one, you know, create and build more affordable housing, two, making sure that we are building public housing and three, creating the pathway to home ownership. I mean, all three of these dynamics play a part in the safety and security of our communities. Um, as Cook County Commissioner, I fought my first major piece of legislation. I fought to end discrimination against those who were formerly incarcerated, um, who were trying to access housing. It is now against the law um, to, 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 to discriminate against families or individuals that are seeking housing and have an arrest record background. And so this is something that is dear to me, something that is personal because I had a brother who had an addiction, who, who had untreated trauma and died addicted and unhoused. And so this becomes top of mind for me as I move forward, um, building a type of coalition and apparatus that addresses this, this immediate crisis. Okay. Um, I want to ask a provocative question, at least what I think is a provocative question, especially based on kind of the tenor of our discussion today. A poll came out just today saying that we're at a dead heat. We have 46% predicting to go with Vallis and 46% predicting to go with um, Commissioner Johnson. Why is this race so close? What are your thoughts on that? I'll let everyone respond. You may go first, Reverend Darren Calhoun. Oh, no, Alder Woman Rosanna, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> I think that we are at a moment of extreme polarization, not only in Chicago, but, you know, in across the nation. I think um, this is also class war. I think that we are seeing the rich. I think that we are seeing big economic interests come into the fold and spend so many resources on making sure that their framework is the one that will prevail. So you are also seeing two different models of campaigning. You are seeing one campaign that is funded by workers, uh, by progressive unions that are black led, uh, that are, that is powered by communities that have people going door to door every day, people phone banking, people texting, uh, people using their own time and energy and labor in order to get this message out. And you have a campaign that is financed mostly by billionaires, the same people that opposed um, 
the fair tax in Illinois and that uh, prevented it from passing so that we could actually have progressive um, progressive taxation in Illinois. So this polarization, we are seeing it everywhere, particularly since um, Trump won the election in 2016. Chicago is not an exception of it. So that is what we're witnessing right now. We're witnessing a lot of power. We're, we're witnessing a, a, um, a clash between the working class and, and the ruling class. And, and I think that that is what's happening right now and is why this race is so tight, because um, it, it's the two really big forces um, that are going against one another. Interesting, very interesting. Reverend Calhoun? Why is this so tight? Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I, I love what the, what the alderwoman shared a moment ago of this class war. And this this is the history of our country, right, where we've been manipulated and led by uh, the wealthy ruling class to fight amongst each other and miss the opportunity for us to unite our power. To unite our voices to unite our communities and to go with the candidates who actually show up for us, who have a good reputation on the streets. Um, you can buy your way to a good reputation in corporate America, but for, for the vast majority of us, unless we become the next billionaires in the city or millionaires in the city, then we won't get that kind of response. And so for me, I think this is an opportunity for us to, one, push past the apathy. You know, I mean, many people, especially young people um, who are turning out, let's be clear, who are turning out to, to polls, but who don't feel like their vote matters, who don't feel like um, engaging this current political system is going to do anything. I think this is an opportunity for us to rally people around these ideas and get, get folks working together on this. Very good. If I, if I could say something real quick again yeah, about this. It. First of all, I, I love what was said already. And I, you know, I think the other piece though is, and the older woman knows it because she goes door to door, is that we're getting into step right now and they're getting afraid, right? Uh, I want to read a quote from, from our, our founder, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. for the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, he said this right before his death as he was recognizing that this wasn't about a race issue, that in fact, if people could unite across color lines as a, as a group of working people, right, poor folks, as he said, that we got it. So the quote goes like this, you know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a favorite formula for doing it. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. Whenever the slaves get together, something happens in Pharaoh's court and he could not hold the slaves in slavery. When the slaves get together, that's the beginning of getting out of slavery. And so wow. I think there, I think the powers of be are worried. Uh, yeah. We're organizing right now and, uh, and, and, and let's keep it going. Yeah, it's very good. Wow, you've just given us so many literary um, insights in addition here. Um, okay, Kalmata, what do you think about why is this such a close race? You're muted. She has something good to say, I know. All right, sorry, I just realized. So I wanted to jump in on this because I, I really liked what everyone else had to say, but I wanted to share something that happened earlier today. I was on another um, Zoom meeting with uh, some, with uh, a, num a number of people who looked like me, similarly situated, and there was clearly a I am I am a, there was clearly a Vallis camp and a Brandon Johnson camp. And not much difference in these people. And so while I agree a lot with the idea about, you know, that there is there's clearly a class thing that's going on here. Um, I also wonder if some of it is that, you know, there's a, a camp of people, um, you know, whatever the race who feel like Vallis is a name they've known for a long time. Um, and, you know, they are maybe willing to uh, discount or or or. Um, make allowances for some of the things that they're hearing now because they feel like they've known him for a while. And then you have a lot of people who are also really wanting something new and really excited about what they're hearing um, uh, come from Brandon Johnson. And so, you know, I, I think that there is that class piece, but I think even beyond that, that there is something else that's going on here that uh, class doesn't necessarily all account for. Because some of the, you know, some of the folks who, you know, sitting looking just alike, uh, economically, racially, otherwise, 
are saying different things. And that I do find that to be really interesting. That is very interesting. Thank you yeah. for bringing that up. All right, Dr. Ortega, we'll let you respond to that. And then we'll hear what Brandon Johnson had to say about that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to offer a little bit of a different angle. And one of the things that have caught my attention in this election, uh, and, and we haven't yet brought up, is the matter of how race may be impacting right, the voter turnout and voter participation in connection to who is being supported. And, and in particular, I, I am pretty, pretty intrigued by the dynamic around uh, Latino and Latinx voters, right, in which I think According to the polls, the most recent polls around a little bit over 40% are supporting Valles and uh, about 30% are, are supporting Johnson, even though we know that black and brown coalitions and, and candidates uh, will be more beneficial, right, for, for the issues that the community cares about. So I, I wonder, right, in, in what not only ways of, of recognition, right, that uh, one candidate may bring to the table, uh, but also ways in which uh, race, right, and perhaps even, um, I'm going to dare to say, uh, anti-Black racism may be playing uh, a particular role that is um, understudied and underanalyzed, right, in in this um, particular race. Um, I don't have fact, facts and figures, right, to, to confirm that, um, but it's something that I'm, that I'm curious, right, about. Um, I'm also uh, concerned that at times uh, in among Latinx community, right, even though we know the impact, the discourse around uh, security and policing can can be effective, right, in, in mobilizing uh, not only in black, black, sorry, brown communities, but also a segment, right, or, or the black community. And, and I think I, I kind of urge us to to be mindful, right, and, and attentive to, to what exactly that, that dimension, right, of, of race will play in this election. Very good. Thank you very much. I, I would like to uh, appreciate that conversation about the dynamics of, of the intraracial connection between uh, Black and Latinx vo voters. Um, that is one of the things that we really have to have to do. We have to look at the ways that we've been impacted and then consider how we how we might um, address the breaches, you know, address the the, the t tensions that exist. And I don't see that necessarily being on everyone's agenda to do. Um, but again, where, where the people are united, we can't be defeated. I really think that uh, that this is an opportunity for us to, to hold whoever's running, whoever, whoever we're considering, and to talk to our families. Um, you know, a lot of us got, got tired when it came to, um, to the, the discourse over the last few years at the president level, but we can't give up. We can't grow weary in our well-doing. We really do have to figure out new ways to not necessarily try to convince people, but more so to let people be heard so that their fears can be addressed so that we can then get back to how do we make this better for everybody who's in our city. Like I said, we want to hear what Commissioner Johnson shared with us earlier today. And I want to reiterate that we were not able to speak with Paul Vallis um, this time around. His schedule would not allow. And then I'm going to let you leave us by telling us something we haven't heard about Brandon Johnson. How might that influence us? What don't we know? What soundbite haven't we gotten through these last many weeks? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Look, you know, our, our city has been deeply divided for a long time. And, you know, of course, people are playing to the fears um, of people. And, and I, I, I recognize that that's something that, you know, that I've, you know, we, we've learned to live through, particularly as black folks, um, where, you know, the characterization of my love and commitment to the people of Chicago um, you know, gets characterized and boxed into a particular dynamic. And I'm not the first person, right? And I don't compare myself to any of these great historical figures, but, you know, you know, the, 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 the tagline when Mary Harold Washington was running, um, you know, you better vote a different way before it's too late, right? I mean, these are dog whistles that are used on a regular basis. But you also have a lot of economic despair and some of those fears, um, you know, are manifesting. But I also recognize the reason why it's so close because I'm speaking to the hopes of people, right? I was polling at 2.3% in October, mm -hmm. but yet here I stand today. And so there were forces who did not expect me to be here. And now that I am, they're using everything in their power. Um, and we're being outspent three to one on television. We're just getting bombarded with you know negative t TV ads because we have made this race close because people didn't expect. I mean, the one thing that people, you know, 
may not be aware of me. I've pretty much have shared you know, my entire story. I mean, I don't, I don't, don't hide, um, you know, you know, my, my approach or my feelings or, you know, what I think is necessary to build a better, stronger, safer Chicago. You know, maybe the one thing that people may not have ever heard, uh, you know, about me is that, you know, you know, sometimes even being raised in a large family, um, you know, you struggle with your own um, security. You want to make sure that, you know, your mental health is strong. And so, you know, I've been far more vulnerable in this moment, really telling my story about what it's like to grow up in a family where, you know, things are harsh, you know, you know, the, the water wouldn't be on, you know, using an orange extension cord to mm -hmm. make from someone's house to your house, just to make sure the refrigerator is plugged in, mm -hmm. but also have like a tremendous amount of just resilience. Like there's nothing, nothing that's going to stop me from making sure that my family is supported and secure and what I want for my family. I want for, for every single family in the city of Chicago. So know that you have someone who has lived the struggle, but have also experienced a type of resilience and love and support from a community that has placed me in a position to run one of the largest economies in the world. Mm -hmm. I would tell you my GPA, because um, I haven't shared that, but I don't want my children to find out because I might lose credibility. <laughs> right. As, I wouldn't want my child to hear either. <laughs> very much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so very much for your time, Commissioner Johnson, and best of luck to you these last few days. Thank you. Thank you to the Community Renewal Society for all the work that you all are doing, bringing you know, our, our, our communities closer together. So thank you for the love that you all express through policy, through organizing. All of that work means a lot to the city of Chicago, really the state of Illinois. So see you all. Very good. Very good. Um, I do want to remind everyone that the Community Renewal Society is having a special time of reflecting, praying and voting tomorrow at noon. You can register. They're going to put up that clip here. It's a time to continue this discussion. Also, if you have questions or thoughts that you'd like to add, please sign on tomorrow at noon to have um, that conversation. We'd like to thank all of our panelists for their time, as well as their thoughtful responses and engaging with the issues that impact our community. We do hope this can help those of you who are undecided to help you shift and move to a position that represents you well. We do say we cannot endorse um, any candidate, but we can endorse voting, and that's what we do. I'm gonna hand this over to Reverend Waltrina Middleton, the Community Renewal Society Executive Director. Thank you for having us and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Katera, and all of our powerful panelists for a challenging and inspiring conversation. To our audience participants, thank you for joining Community Renewal Society, our sponsors, Urban Village and Trinity United Church of Christ and this brilliant rainbow of a beloved community for the 2023 Chicago Mayoral Community Conversation. Remember, on or before Tuesday, April 4th, go forth and vote. We invite you to view the following announcement from our congregational partner, Trinity, regarding COVID-19 awareness, followed by a, a closing charge and prayer. Shall we pray? Divine One, as we depart from here today, we pray for more love, more peace, more healing, more justice, more equity, and more courage to change the things we cannot accept. We are grateful for the privilege to participate in our democratic process as conscious and engaged congregations and citizens who vote. Help us to be courageous citizens post-election and holding our elected officials accountable in all branches of government and areas of public service. We pray for good health and welfare of our neighborhoods, our schools, workplaces, and beyond. 
We pray for knowledge, action, and change so that the future generations to come are welcomed with boundless opportunities, hope, and joy. We pray for both candidates, whether they win or lose, that they will use their platforms for greater good in Chicago and in the world. Go in peace, our friends, and let us be the change we seek and hold each other in love and in the light. Ashe, amen. <laughs>